Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I'm Jerry Sabloff. I'm the, the past president of Santa Fe Institute and now an external professor at SFI. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can promise you tonight uh, it'll be much more fun and definitely more intellectually stimulating than any Republican debate. So, <laughs> certainly, if the last one was any guide. So thank you for being here. We all appreciate it. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to the second night of our 2015 Ulam Lecture Series and very pleased to introduce Jennifer Dunn, SFI's Vice President for Science. Last night, David Krakauer gave you a nice overview of Jen's distinguished career, which I won't repeat. But I do want to say, as an archaeologist, how really tickled I am that Jennifer has been collaborating with archaeological colleagues of mine in bringing important new food, uh, the food web approach, of which we heard in her terrific talk last night, to uh, the world of archaeology and, and the whole realm of human ecology. This introduction of the study of food webs, of which Jennifer has been in the vanguard, has the potential to significantly strengthen archaeological understanding of the past, especially given the long history of archaeological as well as historical and geographic research that has not taken a true systemic approach to humans and, and their environment until very, very recently. So if, if one looks back, and I, I was just having fun uh, go, going back uh, in, in time to uh, the mid-19th century, let me give you a quote of the kind of uh, environmental human thinking that was going on that time, which is very, very deterministic. Uh, here's the quote. Give me the physical map of a country, and I pledge myself to tell you, a priori, what part that country will play in history, not by accident, but by necessity, not at one epoch, but all epochs, end quote. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that when that kind of maximum of determinism was taken to geographical maps, somehow northern western Europe always seemed to be the best place for high civilization to evolve. Coincidence, I'm sure. By the beginning of the 20th century, uh, in reaction to this kind of determinism, uh, one emerged, uh, one saw kind of uh, an approach sometimes labeled possibilism. So here's another quote. There are nowhere necessities but everywhere possibilities, and man as a master of the possibilities is the judge of their use. In other words, there literally was no uh, relationship uh, argued at, at that time between the environment uh, and uh, human uh, ecology and evolution. It was the classic argument against uh, determinists at that time was that similar cultures exist in different environments and different cultures exist in the same environments. Therefore, environment can have no real impact uh, on, on human development. Uh, but in effect, this possibilist view, which held sway in much of the 20th century, essentially says that the explanation of human environmental rela relationship uh, is impossible. Uh, this is not very satisfying for a whole bunch of, uh, of reasons. And fortunately, uh, beginning uh, at, at least in, in the mid 20th century, saw another development, which we might call probabilism, uh, which looked at the causal uh, influence of the environment on certain aspects of human cultural uh, groups, especially technology, uh, but essentially ignored the other aspects of culture. It was not a holistic uh, perspective. And I think this is really uh, the, uh, the key. All of these approaches in the 19th, 20th century, uh, going on till very recently, saw the environment and humans as separate, the environment influencing or not uh, humans in their cultures. But the last few decades, a full systemic ecological view with both humans and the environment as part of the same uh, system has emerged. And as we will see this evening, this is a more scientifically powerful approach with great potential, not just for archaeology, but for the broad understanding of life on the planet. And to really give you uh, a good understanding of this new uh, human ecology, please join me in welcoming Jennifer Dunn, who will be talking to us about the ecological human. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, and thank all of you for coming here tonight. Uh, last night, I discussed the hidden order of complex ecosystems, which I'll recap briefly. There's an extraordinary diversity of, of life on Earth, of species on Earth, 
Um, our best current estimate of non-bacterial species is about 10 million species. Previous estimates have been 3 to 100 million. Um, only 1.2 million are actually described and named. Um, however, um, for me, where all of this enormous diversity gets really interesting is how they process and use one of the fundamental currencies of life, energy. So all life needs energy to fuel its metabolism, to survive and reproduce. And there are two primary ways to um, get energy. First, uh, to be an autotroph, like a plant that gets energy, generates energy directly from solar radiation. Or second, to be a heterotroph, um, like this owl, and get your energy from eating other organisms, in this case by hunting, killing, and feeding on this very poor, unsuspecting little mouse. Um, however, as we know from elementary school, these types of uh, predator prey and more generally what we call consumer resource interactions are embedded in more complex food chains. So this is a food chain from this area. At the base, uh, we have plants. In this case, uh, it's uh, Taraxacum officinal, is in the mouth of the rabbit. That's uh, otherwise known as dandelions. And so that's eaten by the rabbit. And we represent uh, the plant with the green sphere on the right. And the arrow shows the biomass uh, going up into the rabbit, uh, shown in red. And then the rabbit can be eaten by western diamondback rattlesnakes, uh, shown above that. And that we represent by adding a blue node to represent the snake um, and an arrow flowing up to that. And then on top uh, is one of my favorite birds. And it's also the New Mexico state bird, uh, the greater roadrunner in the cuckoo family which eats uh, Western Diamondback Rattlers for dinner, along with a lot of other things, and we represent that with an orange sphere. Of course, this is still a very simplistic view of species interactions. In any habitat, there are hundreds to thousands of co-occurring species that can and do interact with each other through feeding interactions and a variety of other ways of interacting. Any ecological community contains myriad food chains that are all interwoven together, forming a complex food web like this one. So this represents a comprehensive and highly resolved food web for Little Rock Lake in Wisconsin. There are close to 100 species and 1,000 uh, feeding links in this food web. The vertical axis represents trophic level, which is how many feeding links on average animals are from the primary producers at the base of the web, in this case, algae. So trophic level is a measure of how many times biomass is transformed into energy as it passes up and throughout the food web. Dozens of detailed food webs have been compiled and analyzed over the last two decades. Each food web appears intractably complex in and of itself, and various food webs appear to be quite different from each other in a multitude of ways. The number and types of species, the number and types of feeding interactions, the environmental context, and the way all of these species and interactions are glued together in networks of interdependence. I call this the apparent complexity of ecosystems. However, um, and this is the big summary slide from last night, um, it turns out that we can use tools from network theory to analyze and compare the organization and properties of these food webs. When we do, we find quantifiable hidden order in the way that feeding interactions are organized at the ecosystem level. I focused in particular on the pattern of how diet specialists and diet generalists are distributed in a food web. It turns out that the distribution of the number of links per consumer in a food web, uh, shown in the top uh, graph, uh, follows a remarkably universal pattern. Most organisms in a given food web are relatively specialized in their feeding habits, while very few are strong generalists. And we'll be revisiting this issue of diet generality uh, later in this talk. This universal pattern is the same across food webs from diverse habitats, including uh, marine systems, estuaries, lakes, rainforests, and deserts. And it also applies to food webs, like the one uh, in the upper right corner, um, that include the enormous diversity of parasites, which are the blue nodes, um, usually ignored in ecological analyses. It even applies to very ancient ecosystems, shown um, at the bottom right, stretching back more than half a billion years to the Burgess Shale during the time of the Cambrian radiation of multicellular life on Earth. This is despite the fact that many of the marine creatures that lived then had bizarre body plans that no longer exist. They were evolutionary dead ends. Back to energy. So the basic metabolic rate of a human is about the same as a 100-watt incandescent light bulb. 
This is predictable from our body size, as it is for everything from mice to blue whales. As is the case for other animals, we meet our energy requirements by feeding on other organisms. And thus, like all other organisms, humans are a part of complex food webs, both as predators and prey. As a side note, some of you may recognize this particular human, and if you don't, you will after this. <laughs> Ada King, Countess of Lovelace, was born 200 years ago this December, and she was the only legitimate child of Lord Byron. Uh, Ada was an English mathematician and writer, and more importantly, is considered the first computer programmer. She worked with Charles Babbage on his analytical engine, a proposed mechanical general purpose computer, and wrote the first algorithm intended to be carried out by a machine. So she is a foundational part of the intellectual history that led up to the overwhelming centrality of computers to today's science, technology, and culture. Uh, in a sense, her intellectual light bulb shone much brighter than most. And Ada Lovelace Day is on October 13th this year. The day celebrates the achievements of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Yay. <laughs> so it's appropriate that Ada is a figure from history who enlightens our current notions of computing and science. This talk will focus on how humans in the past interacted with species as a way to understand different kinds of roles and impacts humans can have in the context of complex ecological networks. These lessons from the past can provide new ways to understand and promote ecological sustainability in a world dominated in many ways by humans. This image shows 19th century Aleut, a Native American tribe of the Aleutian Island chain of Alaska, fishing for cod from kayaks. The small amounts of fish they caught uh, went directly, uh, directly to their subsistence. The lower image shows a very different relationship between humans and fish. It shows a super trawler strip mining fish off of the West African coast to meet the demands of the global seafood trade. They are indiscriminately catching many different species of fish and marine invertebrates and discarding 90% or more of what they catch. And in fact, um, a study was just released by the World Wildlife Fund, um, which um, tracked uh, uh, several populations across uh, 1,200 species of marine fishes, mammals, birds, and reptiles, um, and looking at changes between 1970 and 2012. And um, there's been an overall 49% uh, reduction in those populations, a 50% reduction uh, just of the fishes, with of course certain fishes like tunas seeing 75% or greater reductions over a 40 year period. So the rest of the talk tonight will focus on how we can use an ecological network framework to think about human roles in and impacts on ecosystems. Although I'll mostly focus on humans as predators in food webs, I wanted to share an amusing little factoid I ran across in Harper's recently about humans getting killed by other species. <laughs> so we've been hearing a lot lately about humans getting attacked by sharks, uh, particularly on the east coast of the United States and in Australia. However, for every one person killed by a shark, 27 people are killed by cows. Although, presumably not because the cows want to eat the people, just because they're probably pissed off at them. Um, so just keep that in mind the next time you're hiking or biking past a cow. Okay, on with the talk. <laughs> While it is clear that humans have, uh, are having major impacts on biodiversity, not much is known in a quantitative way what those impacts mean for complex food webs. Because species are embedded within complex uh, networks of interdependence through feeding and other relationships, disturbances that affect one species have the potential to spill over into many other species through direct and indirect pathways. So let's look at food webs through time for two systems heavily impacted by humans over the past 10,000 years. First, we'll look at the Adriatic Sea, and then we'll take a look at Egypt. This is Rovine a really wonderful coastal town on the Istrian Peninsula of Croatia that I had the pleasure of visiting a few years ago. Ravine was ruled by the Republic of Venice from the late 1200s to the late 1700s, and it has a very Venetian feel. And off to the right, you can see a shrimp boat uh, coming back in. Ravine is located on the northeastern edge of the Adriatic, up towards the top, um, in between Trieste and Pula, and across from Venice. Six countries and many towns and cities are located along the coast of the Adriatic Sea. 
The taking of marine resources by humans has been an integral part of the Adriatic Sea's history for over uh, 10,000 years. Heike Lotz and Marta Kahl, colleagues of mine at Dalhousie University in Canada, compiled a variety of biodiversity, ecosystem function, and food web data over tens of thousands of years of human presence in this region. They considered 10 different cultural periods, uh, from earlier pre-human hunter-gatherer and agricultural periods, to local market classical and medieval periods, to modern and global periods. Throughout time, there has been development, growth, and expansion of trade, markets, and economies from highly localized subsistence and agricultural activities to regional activities to global activities. These changes were driven by increasing commercialism, industrialization, and urbanization. Over the last 2,000 years, which includes the classical, medieval, modern, and global cultural periods, the human population of towns along the Adriatic remained relatively steady at under 20 million people. It began to expand rapidly in the 1700s, reaching over 100 million people today. This, of course, is the pattern of human population growth around the world. This graph shows trends in relative species abundances over the last several tens of thousands of years in the Adriatic. The colored lines are for non-human taxa, and when I use the term taxa, I just mean groups of species that are similar, which show only slight declines until the last one or 200 years, at which point they begin to drop sharply. The exception is birds, which first declined sharply around 500 BC. Humans, shown with the gray line, show the opposite trend, of course. This graph presents species declines in a different way. It shows the percent of species that are classified as depleted, which means that they are at 50% or less of their traditional abundance. Those that are rare, um, which means they're at 10% or less, and those that were completely extirpated, that top line, um, which means they became extinct from the Adriatic. Uh, so the trends for all of these are increasingly negative, and meanwhile, the gray line shows uh, the number of invading non-native mollusks, which has increased sharply over the last 200 years, going from zero to 80. And this graph shows yet another way of classifying species declines in terms of water, water quality. As habitat builders and filter feeders have sharply declined, shown in the colored lines, water quality has become increasingly degraded, um, shown by the gray line. The Adriatic Sea food web follows similar trends, with the greatest impacts uh, seen in the last 200 years of human presence in this region. These two versions of the Adriatic Sea food web are, not nece are necessarily not as detailed as other food webs I have shown and will show, as it is very hard to get detailed species interaction data over multiple time slices. So the taxa in these webs are pretty highly aggregated, and as I said, they're groups of similar kinds of species. From the early modern period, 1500 to 1800, until the late global period now, 25% of taxa groups have either been reduced to such low populations they're effectively not viable, or they've been extirpated. Vertebrates such as seals, turtles, and birds have been particularly hard hit. A version of these images was published in an article in Scientific American on this research in 2012 called The Dwindling Web, How Human Exploitation Has Reshaped a Marine Ecosystem. One consequence of the contraction of the Adriatic Sea food web is that our analyses show that the reduced current webs are much less robust to further perturbation. Any taxa subsequently lost from this food web will result in an ever greater chance that the food web will unravel through cascading extinctions due to species dependencies on each other. Basically, the, the redundancy of feeding roles that used to exist in this food web have been stripped away, leaving it very vulnerable to further disturbance. Okay, let's move a bit south and east uh, from the Adriatic Sea to Egypt. Here is a very simplified environmental timeline of Egypt over the last several thousand years. It shows a long, humid period that stretched from 11,000 years ago to 5,000 years ago. And between 5,000 and 3,000 years ago, there were three major aridification and desertification events. The Great Pyramids were built a bit more than 4,500 years ago, in between the first two major, major aridification events. My SFI colleague, Justin Yackel, and his collaborators were able to reconstruct a detailed Egyptian mammal predator herbivore network over the last 6,000 years of Egyptian history. 
They integrated paleontological and archaeological evidence with depictions of mammals from Egyptian antiquity artifacts to infer which species were present when. For example, this is the Hierakompolis uh, palette, also known as the Two Dogs palette, which is in the Ashmolean Museum of, um, at Oxford. It is about 5,150 years old and shows mammals present in Egypt at that time. Framed by two wild dogs clasping paws, ostrich, hartebeest, wildebeest, ibex, oryx, and giraffe are depicted, as are several fictitious animals, uh, such as serpent-necked panthers that encircle the central depression. On the reverse side, bulls and gazelles confront lions, leopards, and a winged griffin. This hunting scene is from one side of King Tutankhamun's painted box, built more than 3,000 years ago and it displays a variety of different mammals that humans hunted at that time. Artifacts like these from different time periods of Egyptian uh, deep history, combined with other information, allowed the remarkable data reconstruction at the heart of this study. In the late Pleistocene, uh, about 12,000 12, years ago, there were 38 species of mid and large bodied mammals, eight carnivores and 30 ungulate herbivores. The carnivore ungulate piece of the broader food web of Egypt contracted as the climate became more arid and human population densities increased. Most notably, mid-sized herbivores, such as gazelles, which linked to the most predators, declined and disappeared. At the time of the pyramids, about 4,600 years ago, we already see significant declines in the herbivores. By 3,300 years ago, about half of the original species, including some of the predators, were gone. The food web of today retains only 20% um, of the species present in the late Pleistocene. Thus, the Egyptian mammal network effectively collapsed. From 38 species in the late Pleistocene to only eight species, three carnivores and five herbivores today. Analysis of the network through time shows that the predator-prey ratio increased significantly. This indicates the preferential loss of the prey in the system, the ungulate herbivores. Their extinctions were non-random and were associated with the desertification events. The extinctions in this ecosystem, uh, sustained over 6,000 years, were likely attributable to synergies among multiple stressors. Direct impacts from human hunting, the loss of forage for herbivores as land was transformed into agricultural production, and the impacts of climate change uh, on forage and water availability. This study did not pin down the particular causes or their relative contributions to the observed extinctions. That's something for future research. As was the case for the Adriatic Sea food web, analyses showed that the increasingly depauperate Egyptian mammal network was also becoming less and less stable. As the network lost species and links, it lost redundance, which leaves it with decreased ability to withstand further, further perturbations. So these are just two examples of the massive unraveling of some food webs that has occurred over the last several thousand years. In the Adriatic Sea, the 25% reduction of the marine food web, particularly in the last 200 years, is likely mostly attributable to the industrialization of fishing and the expansion of global markets for seafood. And as just mentioned, in the Egyptian mammal net, uh, carnivore herbivore network, even more dramatic declines over the last 6,000 years are probably due to synergies between climate aridification and human hunting and agriculture. In both cases, the food web has lost redundancy and has low robust, ro robustness to future impacts, a snowball effect which will only be magnified by other impacts such as anthropogenic climate change. So far, we don't really have much evidence for the title of this talk, The Ecological Human. It should be the <laughs> non-ecological human. Um, however, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to shift to assessing what roles humans play in food webs, particularly in pre-industrial non-urban contexts. In other words, what can we understand about the ecological roles that humans play as predators and consumers in food webs? This hopefully can provide us with new kinds of insight into sustainability of the complex socio-ecological systems that we are all a part of. This is a photograph of Sanak Island taken by one of my collaborators, Spencer Wood. Sanak is at the far eastern end of the Aleutian Archipelago in Alaska. It is a bit south and west of the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula. It has been ice-free for 16,000 years. 
There is a 6,000 year record of human presence on Sennac with 128 known sites shown here in yellow, mostly around the perimeter of the main island. And the archeological work was done by, by my colleague, Herb Mashner. The people who became the Aleut crossed Beringia 8,000 to 10,000 years ago. They had a peak population across the Aleutian island chain of 15 to 25,000. They were foragers and they foraged in every habitat available to them, the marine system, the freshwater system, and the terrestrial system. The population of Sennac was probably in the dozens to hundreds, increasing over time, with lower populations during warm periods due to less marine productivity. The last of the Sennac Aleut left Sennac Island in the 1960s to move to King's Cove on the tip of the Alaskan Peninsula for fish cannery jobs. The research I'll describe is part of a broader project meant to integrate archaeological, ecological, and climatic data in order to understand various aspects of the biocomplexity of the Sennac Archipelago over the last several thousand years. And uh, one thing to note is the Sennac Alley, the, um, they have a corporation, the Sennac Corporation, which still owns and controls the Sennac Archipelago. And they were very supportive. We could not have been there doing this work without their support. Um, one of the main reasons they're supportive of this work is because they, it's actually very much in their interest to have scientific studies documenting their feeding habits and their hunting habits through time. Uh, because this is important in terms of what rights they have now in terms of fishing and hunting um, in today's world. So that this kind of uh, scientific information actually makes its way into legal cases in some cases. So they're very supportive of this work. The questions I'm particularly interested in are what roles did pre-industrial humans play in North Pacific food webs? How did human foragers compare to other species? And what can we learn about sustainability, if anything, from how humans interacted with and impacted other species? Uh, previous food web data sets, like the ones I discussed yesterday, did not explicitly include humans as a node within the food web. Ecology traditionally studies human-free nature. Or it studies what kinds of human impacts uh, might be on human-free ecosystems. Uh, it treats humans as an external forcing factor. For example, for my PhD, I studied uh, the impacts of simulated climate warming on subalpine meadow ecosystems in the Colorado Rockies. Of course, ecosystems are not human free at all. There is no ecosystem on Earth that is free of human impacts. They, and they have not been so for a very long time. We feel that ecological networks are a good way to bring humans back into ecology analysis. And Sennac Island provided an excellent place to see what we could do along those lines. As was the case in the Egyptian study, we integrated several different kinds of data to come up with our food webs. The top photo shows my colleagues Spencer Wood and Rolly Russell systematically sampling the diversity of species in the intertidal system of Sennac. The bottom left photo shows a sample archaeological pit dug into a midden. These are old trash heaps often associated with human home and cooking sites. The bottom right photo shows some of what comes out of those midden cores, lots and lots of bones and shells. The archaeologists can identify these to the species. These types of field-based data were augmented uh, with information from the literature, with ethnographic information, and interviews with Aleut elders about their traditional eating habits. Because a lot of times, uh, things that they um, ate were all soft body parts and weren't preserved um, in the middens. So here are a few of the species that we know that the snack Aleut ate. It includes everything from algae uh, to sea cucumbers, and which of course, are actually not cucumbers. Um, they are animals, and it's a little hard for me to believe that anybody would eat a sea cucumber. <laughs> but they did. <laughs> to shrimp, uh, octopus, mollusks, and sea otters. And here are even more species the Sennac Aleut ate, um, including sea urchins, anemones, fishes, clams, and seals and sea lions. Here is one food chain of many that the Sennac Aleut were a part of. The Aleut ate sea lions, which ate great sculpins, which ate shrimp, which ate phytoplankton. An idealized food chain is shown on the right, where primary producers are shown in green, invertebrates in yellow, uh, fishes in orange, and mammals, including the humans, in red. When all of the feeding interaction data among the nearshore marine species, as well as species like humans, which forage extensively in the marine habitat, are compiled, this extremely complex food web pops out. 
The colors mean the same things I just mentioned with the addition of birds in purple and miscellaneous taxa like protozoa, bacteria, and lichen in blue. With 513 species and almost 6,800 feeding links, this is the most diverse and highly resolved marine food web out there. And it is the only detailed complex food web to explicitly include humans. Humans are there pointed to near the top of the web. The Sanak Aleut fed on 122 species in this food web, which is almost a quarter of the species available to them. The things that they fed on are shown here in color. A couple of things are noticeable. Humans fed at all trophic levels, from primary producers to top carnivores, and they fed on a wide diversity of organisms, as shown by the colors of the prey species. So when I was first looking at this data, you know, I was like, well, 122 species seems like a lot. But really, how does it actually compare to other prey species? This histogram shows the number of predators that have a particular number of prey species. In other words, this shows the distribution of number of links from consumer species to resource species. As we saw yesterday, most consumers are relatively specialized with five or fewer resources, and those are the ones labeled specialists to the left. However, there is what we call a very long tail to the right, uh, consisting of a few highly generalized feeders, which feed on 50 or more resource species. Humans are way out at the end of the tail, along with Pacific cod, they can be considered super generalists in this food web. And this does follow a similar kind of exponential distribution like we have seen for other food webs, which I discussed yesterday. In this version of the web, I have darkened only those species and their links that are more than two links away from humans. It turns out that 96% of the species in this marine food web are within two links of humans. That includes the species that humans feed on directly and all the species connected to those, either as predators or as prey. In other words, humans were very closely connected to almost all the other species uh, within this ecosystem. Thus, humans played very particular and potentially important roles in this food web. They were super generalists. Uh, they were highly omnivorous, feeding on many different kinds of species at multiple trophic levels. And they had short path lengths uh, connecting them to most other species. Something also important to take into account is that they sometimes use hunting and fishing technology like kayaks, spears, and fish hooks, allowing them to feed more strongly than they should be able to given their body size. So although humans were positioned to greatly negatively affect the marine food web, in this uh, system there were no apparent long-term extinctions over 6,000 years, whether due to humans or to climate. We decided to do some modeling to investigate how a species like humans could invade a system like this 6,000 years ago, bringing with them hunting technology and special roles and not induce lots of extinctions. We used a relatively simple model of dynamics of species feeding interactions, which can be boiled down in this way. What we're trying to do is to track changes in species biomasses over time. So if you think about a food web, there's a bunch of different populations, a species represented within the food web. And you've, I've just been showing snapshots of the structure of the food web. But what's really going on, of course, is that through time, due to the interactions between species, some species are increasing in terms of their numbers and their total species biomass across all the individuals. And then they're contracting and they're getting bigger again. And that's happening for all the species concurrently. And so you get these very interesting complex dynamics through time. So what does that do to? What we've done is we've boiled that down to three factors. You know, and again, this is a very simplified view, but um, feeding is very central to um, ecological dynamics. So you can lose biomass or um, individuals uh, due to just metabolic activity, just basically burning energy to live. Um, you can gain biomass by eating resources, by eating prey, and you lose biomass to consumers by the things that eat you. So um, all of that, you're not supposed to understand this. <laughs> That's um, all of that um, and a little bit more is encoded into mathematical formulas um, and which we use to simulate the changes in species biomasses and populations over time in idealized food webs. We took a bunch of idealized food webs and we basically let them run until uh, we just had a bunch of species that were dynamically changing but none of the species were going extinct so they were dynamically persistent through time and we invaded them with a species that had the characteristics of the Sanak Aleut, um, with a super generalist species that was highly omnivorous. 
We also added a parameter to our models, which we could change to reflect the ability of the invader to sometimes feed more strongly than expected for its body size. This was how we simulated the use of hunting technology. This graph shows the proportion of species that go extinct when the food web is invaded by this human-like species. From left to right, the invader feeds strongly on increasing fractions of its prey species. What we see is that as long as the invading species limits how many species it feeds on strongly, there are relatively few extinctions. And indeed, the Sanak Aleut only used hunting technology occasionally. Often, they were just in the inner tidal, gathering shellfish for dinner. Another thing that's going on in this model, which reflects what goes on in nature, is that all generalists in food webs prey switch. When it gets harder to find or capture some preferred prey species for food, for whatever reason, the predator switches to something else, even if it is less preferred. So basically what happens, a generalist has many potential prey species, but it has preferences, and it's, if a preferred species is there and available, it'll go after it and kill it and eat it. Um, but sometimes, part, you know, and often just in response to the predation pressure, you know, that uh, individuals go away, they're eaten, it gets harder and harder to find individuals of that preferred species, and then all of a sudden, some slightly less preferred species that it has, is now more abundant and more um, right there, so the generalist uh, predator starts going after this different species. So this kind of prey switching has been shown repeatedly for all kinds of generalists and all different kinds of food webs. And it turns out that within a food web context, it's very, very stabilizing for the food web. Um, it allows um, the focal prey species to recover um, from heavy predation. And, um, and it basically minimizes how many extinctions you see um, as compared to if a generalist just kept focusing, focusing, fo focusing on the same species without ever changing. And like other generalists, humans in this system prey switched. When the weather was really nice, the snack alley would hop into their kayaks and they would go and hunt marine mammals, particularly sea lions, which they both ate and used their hides for their kayaks. When the weather was terrible, which was much of the time, um, they would just focus their efforts on foraging for shellfish in the intertidal. So in summary, although humans played special, potentially disruptive roles in this food web, and had the potential for even more disruptive impact through their use of hunting technology, the Sanak Aleut engaged in ecologically normal behavior in terms of prey switching and minimal strong feeding. These were factors that likely helped to minimize uh, negative effects such as extinctions over thousands of years, combined with other things like the fact that the human population wasn't massive on the island and that you have uh, the ability for species to recolonize from outside the system. We can contrast this with other cases such as bluefin tuna in today's world. Bluefin populations have been decimated compared to historical levels, uh, most recently as a result of high demand in the luxury sushi market. In this case, as the bluefin tuna gets rarer, their value to humans, in this case their economic value, goes up. So instead of switching to some other more abundant fish, which is what an ecological generalist would do, Humans instead increase fishing pressure on the bluefin, driving them ever closer to extinction. This is a very non-ecological behavior that's obviously really bad news for the bluefin tuna. But it's also bad news for the food webs it's a part of. It introduces a destabilizing dynamic that can result in further extinctions and the rapid unraveling of the food web. This type of divergence of modern industrialized human predators from other predators in terms of their behavior and impact was highlighted in a very recent paper published in the journal Science on the unique ecology of human predators. It suggests that modern humans function as an unsustainable super predator, and that's actually the term they used, just like I use the term super generalist. The study showed that humans are extreme in preferentially killing adult prey and adult prey are where the reproductive capital of populations resides. They kill them at a far higher rate than non-human predators. This is particularly true for terrestrial carnivores and fishes. Okay, let's move on to the final case study, which is centered on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. We're moving almost due south from the Aleutian Islands, which form a border between the Bering Sea and the North Pacific Ocean, down to the South Pacific Ocean, 
The Polynesian expansion was the most dramatic burst of overwater exploration in human history. Around 3,500 years ago, a seafaring and farming people originating in the Bismarck Archipelago, northeast of New Guinea, swept nearly 2,000 miles across open oceans east of the Solomons to reach Fiji, Samoa, and Tonga. They became the ancestors of Polynesians. By 1,000 years ago, the Polynesians had reached and invaded every habitable bit of land in the vast triangle of ocean marked by Hawaii, New Zealand, and Easter Island. A variety of archipelagos make up French Polynesia, whose most well-known islands are Tahiti and Bora Bora in the Society Islands. Our project, which seeks to explore the socio-ecosystem dynamics of natural human networks on Polynesian islands, is focused on three of the Society Islands, Malpiti, Rayate, and Morea, and on one of the Gambier Islands further to the east, Mangareva. We're in the very early stages of this research. I'll focus for now on Morea, next to Tahiti, which is a relatively young, large, and nutrient-rich island, and Mangareva of the far-off Gambia Islands to the east, which is relatively old, small, and nutrient-poor. Both currently support smaller human populations than they did hundreds of years ago. These islands are useful to study and compare because they were invaded by humans at the same time a thousand years ago, and they had similar but slightly different pre-human ecologies and environment, environmental contexts. So we're using an ecological network framework to understand dif different ecological and cultural development outcomes on the islands. Some islands, like Morea, have sustained more humans, fewer extinctions, and lower environmental degradation compared to islands like Mangareva. And I'm personally interested in quantifying how humans interacted with other species over time on these different islands. In addition, we are developing dynamic models of feedbacks between the ecosystems and environment and human behaviors related to different modes of resource extraction, subsistence, agricultural, and economic. We intend for this research and our models to inform forecasting and decision-making related to the sustainability of these islands as socio-ecological systems. To that end, we are interacting quite actively with local Poly Polynesian politicians, man managers, educators, and elders who are active supporters of this research. When Polynesians arrived a thousand years ago, they brought dozens of species with them. Effectively, they brought their own little food webs in their canoes with them. These included two to three dozen mostly agricultural plant species, including breadfruit, taro, banana, yams, coconut, sweet potatoes, sugarcane, and turmeric. They also brought at least a dozen animal species. Some were intentional livestock, such as pigs, chickens, and dogs. Others were unintentional hitchhikers, the Pacific rat, lizards, snails, and various insects. Humans directly interacted with hundreds of species on these islands. The archaeologists involved with this project, Pat Kirch, working on Mangareva, and Jenny Kahn, working on the Society Islands, are compiling data on all of the myriad species that humans interacted with, including the species' relative abundance during 200-year uh, time slices over the thousand years of human occupation. We are using these data to construct human-centered interaction networks in order to see how they change across time and across the islands and to see whether and how they are associated with other factors, such as extinctions, agricultural production, and size and age of the islands. In addition to using species for food, drink, and spices, humans also use species in other major ways, for medicine, for clothing, ritually, for fuel, for housing, as ornamental garden plants, and um, for artifacts. And artifacts include anything from canoes to spears to bowls to fish hooks, anything portable, basically. Um, a number of species were used for multiple purposes. The sea snail turbo, for example, was eaten as well as carved into fish hooks and vegetable peelers. Our first set of data are emerging from the work done by Pat Kirch over the last 15 years um, on Mangareva. Mangareva lies about 1,000 miles east of Tahiti and Morea. It has a rich, large lagoon, but very limited land. The story of Mangareva is really amazing. For the first 300 or 400 years of human presence, Mangareva had a population of several, uh, several thousand people and it engaged in trade with the Marquesas and the Society Islands to the west. They also expanded their population to two small, marginally habitable islands a few hundred miles to the east, Pitcairn and Henderson. Pitcairn was particularly important because it was a source of hard basalt rock that was not present on Mangareva that was really important for making tools. <clears throat> 
However, the monger ravens, the Polynesians of Mongareva, engaged in excessive logging to clear for agriculture, leading to almost complete deforestation and severe environmental degradation. This was really aggravated by rats and humans decimating the bird populations whose guano was the only source of renewable nutrients. As a result of the deforestation, the Polynesians of Mongareva no longer had logs necessary for making canoes, which were needed for inner island trade, either with the major islands to the west or Pitcairn and Henderson, um, who completely depended on Mongareva. Now, this does seem like a really serious oversight. <laughs> Let's see, if we cut all the trees down, how are we going to actually do any of this trade that we need to do? <laughs> So the two small islands were quickly abandoned. And Mongareva, now isolated, underwent cultural breakdown, its population severely contracting. Jared Diamond counts Mongareva as one of the classic collapse stories, along with Easter Island or Rapa Nui further to the east. And the name Pitcairn may be familiar to some of you. It was reinvaded by humans in 1790, in particular by the mutineers of the HMS Bounty led by Fletcher Christian. Although Pitcairn was uninhabited when they landed, the mutineers found evidence that it wasn't always so. Temple platforms, petroglyphs, and stone tools gave testimony to Pitcairn's former Polynesian settlers. And the HMS Bounty mutineers had a hard time making their own living on Pitcairn, something the Polynesians had already figured out a few hundred years pre pre previous to that. So much of the data that Pat is compiling comes from digs at sites such as this, the Nanenga Iti Rock Shelter on Mongareva nearby Atolls. An enormous amount of archeological material comes out of these digs, including bones and shells, as well as many types of artifacts like fish hooks and sinkers. Analysis of just the fish bones at this one site reveal that humans were hunting and eating a diverse assemblage of reef and benthic, benthic fishes, in this case dominated by parrotfish, groupers, and convict tangs. An initial look at the human use of species in Mongareva reveals that they interacted directly with a minimum of 330 taxa. While the majority of links from humans to other species were for food, they also used many other species for artifacts and as garden ornamentals, as well as fuel. All eight categories of use are represented, including the use of kava as a ritual soporific. Several dozen of the species had multiple types of uses. Of the species that were eaten, the great majority were marine fishes, but a variety of marine invertebrates, plants, birds, and mammals, and algae were also eaten. One of the mammal feeding links is a cannibalistic link of human eating human, and not in the sense that I talked about yesterday. <laughs> um, so yesterday I talked about how mammals are actually um, obligate uh, cannibals because the young uh, feed on mother's milk. So cannibalism isn't always the killing and complete eating of something, it's any biomass transfer between two individuals of the same species. So humans are obligate cannibals in that way. But this was the more kind of traditional cannibalistic link. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that there's a lot of, there's archeological evidence of the cannibalism that occurred during the period of cultural breakdown. So I had a quote from the famous, uh, famous Anglo-Irish satirist Jonathan Swift who wrote Gulliver's Travels uh, last night, and tonight I bring you another. In 1729, Swift published a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people in Ireland being a burden on their parents or country and for making them beneficial to the public. We just don't have titles like that anymore. So as a part of that, he wrote, I have been assured by a very knowing American of my acquaintance in London that a young, healthy child, well nursed, is at a year old a most delicious, nourishing, and wholesome food. Indeed, the Monger Ravens may, um, they probably resorted to cannibalism in the face of food sh shortages. He was joking about it, they were not. Ultimately, we intend not only to compare human centered use networks among French Polynesian islands through time. We're also compiling comparable data sets for the Aleutian Island system I already talked about, and for nearby southwest ancient Puebloan sites near Mesa Verde in southern Colorado um, via work done by Stephanie Crabtree. I'd like to do this type of comparison for as many places through time as I am able. <laughs> 
Also, as we did for Sanak Island, we are also compiling detailed full food web data, including humans for Morea, building on a previous project called Morea Biocode. This project, led by Neil Davies, who's at UC Berkeley and is the director of the Gump Field Station on Morea, um, and also led by Chris Meyer of the Smithsonian, and Neil is involved in, uh, in the current Morea work that I was just talking about. Um, basically, this involved DNA barcoding of all non-microbial species on the island and in the surrounding waters. This was a massive undertaking. Having the more complete food web data, which will take quite a while to compile, we have the species list, but uh, filling in the feeding links takes a long time, will allow us to see how humans compared to other species in the Morea food webs and their roles and impacts as predators, and also to compare to other systems like Sanac, and also the ancient Pueblo insights, because Stephanie has compiled this kind of data for those sites. All of this research and much, much more is feeding into an ambitious, unique project to turn all kinds of research based on Morea, which is very well studied, including ecological, marine, archaeological, economic, physical oceanography, cultural and social, geographic, climatic, so on and so on, um, into an integrated virtual ecology lab. As this news piece from earlier this year in the journal Nature states, a digital version, um, a digital version of Morea will provide a way to experiment with an entire ecosystem. This is being done explicitly with future sustainability and planning in mind. It is a way of making the rubber meet the road in terms of integrating and transforming tons of piecemeal scientific research into something rigorous and quantitative that can be used to uh, forecast possible futures for the island under different kinds of scenarios. Morea, in this case, in a sense, is serving as a microcosm for the whole world. This is called the Morea Idea Project, the Island Digital Ecosystem Avatar. <laughs> and it consists of an international consortium of universities, including Berkeley, CNRS in France, ETH Zurich, Oxford, and Santa Barbara, as well as the Santa Fe Institute through my own involvement. Ultimately, all of this research is meant to provide new ways of understanding our roles within ecosystems and our impacts on ecosystems through our myriad interactions with other species whether as hunter-gatherers, as backyard gardeners, or as consumers in a giant food industrial complex. One thing is clear, if we want a sustainable future, it will require understanding these types of things in a much deeper, more quantitative, and more nuanced way, and it will require consciously placing limits on extreme non-ecological behavior. It's time for us to embrace our ecological human potential. And as was the case last night, I owe big thanks to dozens of people who were involved in the research described tonight, as well as much more that I didn't have time to discuss. But there are a few key collaborators I want to acknowledge who were centrally important to the work described here, many of whom I mentioned throughout the talk. Uh, this research was supported financially in large part by various grants over the last 10 years from the National Science Foundation. And as always, I'm extremely grateful to the Santa Fe Institute and to my excellent friends and colleagues there for providing an intellectually stimulating and supportive environment for conducting this kind of transdisciplinary fundamental research on complex systems. And finally, thank you very much for joining me tonight. So there's time for a few questions. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually didn't talk about information tonight. I mentioned it last night. I mean, the two basic currencies of life on Earth are that of information. Um, so think of, for example, genetic material is passing on information from one generation to the next, and energy, which is the thing that we need in order to fuel our metabolic processes in order to have life on Earth. And so really what the the ecological network um, research that I'm talking about really focuses on the energy part of that equation. And basically, what, how, how does life organize itself at different scales and through time in order to um, supply and provide and process the energy needed to support this huge diversity of life? So that's, you know, very simple kind of uh, 
general big picture overview on that. In the back. A very what ecosystem? Ah, oh, great. Right, so the question was um, the Aleutian Islands are, um, are part of a very productive ecosystem and um, are we studying differences in productivity across islands in the Aleutians to understand kind of the impacts on, on food webs and other things. Um, so that would be a great thing to be able to study because I mean I think, I mean one of the things I didn't necessarily make it super explicit is that doing these kinds of comparisons is really powerful. And we always look for opportunities to do comparative research. Um, I don't have that, we don't have that kind of information for the Aleutians, so we really focused, that was really a, a test case um, to see what we could get out of doing a food web type of analysis, including humans explicitly for one particular part of the Aleutian Islands. Um, but in the process of putting together um, the data that uh, resulted in the food web that I showed for SNAC, my colleague Spencer Wood actually created a massive database that includes many, many thousands of species and tens of thousands of feeding act uh, interactions for the entire North Pacific. And, um, and so what's, what we're doing now with that kind of, and increasingly people are putting together these kinds of very broad um, data sets. And we make queries of those data sets based on particular sets of species in different places. So we have the potential, if we know what relative levels of productivity are um, in different spots along the Aleutians or in the North Pacific, of actually doing the kind of comparison that you're talking about. And it's certainly something, I mean, uh, the productivity, and I mentioned this very brief briefly, is very much linked uh, to how warm it is. Um, so uh, in marine systems, warmth is actually bad for productivity. Um, so you see very clearly in populations of the snack Aleut um, and also of marine mammals and other things, their populations go down during periods of low productivity associated with warmer climate. So there are some very interesting sorts of patterns that we have started to see with some of that. In the back. Right. Um, uh, well, let me, let me address the second one because I thought about it a little bit after we talked. Um, so the second question was um, to comment on the idea that the planet doesn't need humans, <laughs> but humans need the planet. And um, uh, I mean, this, I was talking about this with a colleague at work today, or I was talking about the age of species through evolutionary time. And, um, no species is forever in the geologic time cycle. All species go away. Um, and that's going to be true for humans, too. Um, so, uh, uh, so <laughs> and, you know, and this is actually, I mean, this is also something that feeds into, eco and so that's evolutionary dynamics. Species on average uh, exist for about 2 million years. Humans have been around um, as a species for about 200,000 years you know, at what point we wink out of the geologic time, who knows, but it's gonna happen at some point. So no, the planet doesn't need us, just like it doesn't need any species. But yes, every species depends on the other species that it interacts with in some way um, when, it's, when they're existing. Another thing about ecological dynamics, um, uh, humans have had this, you know, increasing population trajectory over time, but ecological dynamics tells us that species, they don't go up forever. They cycle, their population cycle. We see this repeatedly, and we see it both in empirically and in, and in model systems. And humans are not going to escape that dynam dynamic either. Again, what, what time scales we're talking about, I have no idea. But there's a lot of interesting issues around that. So, yes? Yeah, so the question is basically, um, what about Hawaii? Um, it's a volcanic island. Um, and I mean, 
there's many ways of thinking. I mean, there's a lot of very interesting research that has happened in Hawaii, and I'd actually, there's, a, there's very good opportunities to replicate, to do this kind of work on Hawaii. And in fact, Pat Kirch has done a lot of work on Hawaii along with a lot of ecologists. Um, and I just want to say something more generally about islands. I mean, I've been talking a lot about islands in the second half of the talk. Um, islands are just these really nice microcosms. They're these kind of contained little systems that, um, that provide a sort of manageable place to study you know, a, a wide array of much broader issues, but in an integrated sort of contained way. And so they've proven very useful to a lot of different uh, natural and social scientists in terms of studying things that would, might be a little harder to sort of contain or um, put boundaries on on a big continent. And the idea is that we can take lessons that we learn from islands, and especially where we can do comparative work, and sort of apply those to much broader places um, that aren't as obviously contained as an island ecosystem. So um, I've be, been, become very convinced of sort of the utility of studying islands over the last few years because of this. Yes? <laughs> I know it's it's always a little hard. You don't want to be totally doom and gloom. Yeah, I mean there there's a couple of different things. Uh, so the question was, you know, what can we take away from this that's not completely doom and gloom, especially in light of things like climate change, um, and you know this was. I mean, in terms of, and I mentioned some of this in terms of the specific work, especially on, on, uh, on Morea and in French Polynesia, where we're working really closely with the Polynesians in order to come up to use the science to talk about planning in the context of things like coming pl climate change and how it's likely to affect Morea and other islands in terms of things like even like mosquito control or what kinds of choices to make about tourism, how much development to allow or not to allow, given you know, what we understand about the climate, about the food webs, about you know, the relative sort of taking of fish from the lagoons versus uh, 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 agriculture and other things. And um, so there's, so we're working very actively in a positive way in that sense in a more local, um, in a more local context of Maria. Um, in terms of the bigger picture, uh, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do and also with the paper that I mentioned that just came out in science is to, it's really helpful to put our fingers on, um, you know, what really unecological behavior is and what it means. Uh, things like this super predator kind of finding and the way that we're fishing, overfishing the seas. You know, and that requires us taking that information and doing something with it. And that, that's not just you and me, but that's actually policies and setting limits in very serious ways. Um, so, you know, I think knowledge is important. If we don't know what we're doing and we don't know what, are, what different kinds aspects of behavior are having negative impacts versus neutral impacts or perhaps even positive impacts. We can't even begin to do the right things in terms of policy and making intelligent limits and decisions. But it's a hard question, so.